Welcome back to Flute Tube. Since it's summer, I figure you all have a lot more time to read right now. And I want to do a book review of a book that was really important to me when I was about a 22 year old music student. All the musicians I knew at Juilliard were talking about and reading this book. In fact, they were having the author come to do a little bit of a seminar at Juilliard about this topic. It's called The Inner Game of Tennis. It's by Timothy Galway. It was really popular, so he ended up writing a whole bunch of other related books. There's The Inner Game of Work, The Inner Game of Stress, The Inner Game of Golf, and for us in the 80s, The Inner Game of Music came out. So there's a book for musicians, but I actually prefer The Inner Game of Tennis. I think mostly just because Tim Galway was a tennis instructor, so it's like reading the book that's in his native language. This is good too though, we might talk about it some other time and definitely take a look at it, but I just find I prefer this one. And since this again is a topic that's not just about flute, it's about you as a whole person and a whole musician, I went back to Whole Foods, but kind of on strike, I didn't buy much of anything. I only bought things that seemed to me to be something that reminded me of tennis. So I'm gonna open up first this highball energy, lemon lime sparkling energy water that seems to have a lot of vitamin B and niacin in it. So the inner game is the mental game that you need to play in order to win the outer game. The outer game, of course, is external things, playing the flute or playing tennis or playing the piano. But in order to do your very best, you have to master the inner game. And the goals of the inner game are to clear your mind of all confusion and to obtain this state of concentration and focus. You wanna get rid of concentration lapses, nervousness, self-doubt, and self-condemnation. He makes the point that the art of relaxed concentration is the most important art to have because in order to master any other art, you need to be able to do this. He says that the secret to winning lies in not trying too hard, to just relax and to let it happen. Tim Galway makes the point in this book that the problem with performance is not that we haven't learned what to do, it's that we don't do what we know. We become our own worst enemy and we try too hard, we get in our own way. We're after peak performance, especially when we're under pressure. So we want to get into what people say is in the zone or in the flow of the action. And we don't want to be thinking too hard and preventing that from happening. It has to be unconscious and instinctive and your mind has to just be at rest and at one with your body. He also makes the point that the skill of effortless concentration, relaxed, focused concentration is great for everything you do in your life. That's why he has this whole series of books where he applies it to everything, not just tennis. And I've always thought that as a musician, I'm really lucky to have to master this skill. And people who do any skill where they have to perform under pressure have the same kind of situation where being in a performance puts you in this kind of pressure cooker where you have to deal with your own mental game. And if you can master it, then it makes you a more calm and relaxed person. You trust yourself more. You deal better with all kinds of pressure situations in life because you have to. You have to learn to be calm and deal with it. Otherwise, you'll just become neurotic and you'll hate to perform. One of the things that he talks about the most that he just keeps coming back to is that you have to examine your self-talk. Whether we're in a high pressure situation or we're just practicing, we engage in self-talk. So we say, you know, oh, that sounded really bad. I fail so badly whenever I try to hit the ball in the center of the racket or whatever. <laughs> I shouldn't talk about tennis because I know nothing about it. I sound so bad when I try to do that G to A trill every single time. There, that's better. <laughs> so we're talking to ourselves, but who is talking to whom? it's implied that you're talking to somebody. So if you say, I am talking to myself, then who is I and who is myself? And the point that he makes is that there is a self one who is the I and a self two who's the myself. So self one is talking to self two. And he says that self one is the teller and self two is the actor. 
So self one is the person who's always trying to instruct you as to what you're supposed to do. Um, I'm supposed to do this and this and this. And self two is the person who's trying to execute. And the main point of the book is that self one needs to trust self two. That relationship between self one and self two needs to be strong and healthy. So for me, most of the value of this book is in discovering who self one and self two are. He talks about self two as being the natural learner that every human being was born with. So when you were a kid and you were crawling around and then you started to walk, it was a very instinctive process. You didn't have to t go through this whole long list of requirements for yourself. You just instinctively figured out how to do it and then you got better and better and as you got better, you stopped crawling and you started walking. Self one needs to respect self two and develop trust for self two. And how you do this is mostly by quieting self one, by telling self one to get out of the way. He gives you a series of steps, how to get it together mentally. The first one that he says is that you need to have the clearest possible mental image of your desired outcome. Self two does not learn through words. Self two learns through how things feel and how things look, images, um, so if you can feel what feels right and return to that feeling rather than a lot of verbal instructions to yourself. The next big thing that he says is what I've been talking about to trust yourself. And then the third thing that he talks about is to see yourself non judgmentally. He says that if you watch someone and you watch their facial expressions, that can tell you a lot about self one. When I have flute students who are playing for each other in flute class, often when they get to the end of the performance, they'll make a big face. And so we always tell each other, don't make a face. And the reason for that is that it's showing that your self one has stepped in and said, oh, that was no good. We don't want self one to step in and tell not only ourselves, but also the audience, oops, that didn't go so well. We just want to let self two perform without judgment from self one. Learning is just a natural process that should unfold. And we understood that when we were children, but as we grew up, we somehow lost that idea and convinced ourselves that learning is a very complicated process, but it's not. <laughs> I gotta be a lot more careful with these. These are organic heirloom medley cherry tomatoes. I should be much more careful with how I interact with them. Anyway, I want to read a few more notes of the things that I wrote down. Let's see, he says self one should watch how it talks to self two. Look up to self two. Don't disparage self two. And use self two's language of images. Um, again, with respecting self two, remember that no teacher is greater than one's own experience. So if you learn what it feels like to do something right, that's going to give you a lot more knowledge than a teacher trying over and over to describe to you how it should be done right. Self two likes to see things as a unit. So, you know, like if you're swinging a racket in tennis, wants to see the whole swing as one gesture, not as here's what I do with my back, here's what I do with my shoulder, here's what I do with my racket. You just want to feel the whole thing in one gesture. And that of course applies to music as well. He talks about when you have a bad habit, you don't want to just tell yourself to stop doing that habit. You want to replace it with a new habit. It is much more difficult to break a habit when there is no adequate replacement for it. Another thing that he says is that as a tennis instructor, he tells students, let the serve serve itself. And musicians say this too, will say things like, let the music play. So you don't want yourself to get in the way of the music. You don't want ego to take over. You want to get out of the way and let the music play itself. That plane is noisy. I'm gonna wait for this plane to go by. Oh, I also got these green olives. Cast Castelvetrano olives. But they remind me of tennis also. All right, now that the plane has gone by, we can kind of return here. So he talks about relaxed concentration being the supreme art 
because no art can be achieved without it. And he says that one way tennis players deal with this is they always say, watch the ball, keep your eye on the ball. <laughs> But how to keep your mind on the ball is a different matter. So you have to think about really specific ways to stay focused and in the moment. And he gives a list of things that tennis players do to keep their eye on the ball. Maybe you watch the seams of the ball. So you have to be really focused in to see the seams. Maybe you think of exactly when it's going to bounce and exactly when it's going to hit your racket and just say bounce, hit, bounce, hit over and over so that your concentration stays in the present. He also talks about competition and what you want to get out of competition. And he says that he had a debate for many years with his father about whether competition was good or bad. And he ended up deciding that competition really is okay if you do it for the right reasons. And he said that what made him come to this conclusion was a talk that he had with his dad about surfers. The surfer doesn't want to ride a little wave that presents no challenges. The surfer's out there waiting for the big wave. And that's really what you should hope to get out of a competition. You want somebody who's going to challenge you. You want an event that's going to pull out all of your best qualities and make you perform at your very best level. And he said that when he realized that, it was very freeing because it's not that we're trying to have one person be the victor and the other person be the loser. It's that we're all meeting there together to do our very best. Of course, in the end, he talks about how focusing on the inner game helps your life beyond the tennis court, beyond the musical performance. He says the cornerstone of stability is to know that there is nothing wrong with the essential human being. And that essential human being is self too. And I'll just put in one personal note here, which is that a colleague gave me one of my favorite compliments I've ever received a couple of summers ago. We were in the middle of a bunch of performances and she turned to me and she said, I don't think you realize how lucky you are to be so calm. It's such a blessing to you, but it's also a blessing to the people around you. And that really touched me coming from her. It meant a lot that she would say that. But it also got me thinking a lot because I have always been a pretty calm person. But I think it's very cyclic that because I'm calm, I'm able to perform well. But because I trust myself performing, I get better at the inner stability and the inner calm, um, that trust of self too. And I think it's something that performers and actors, musicians, athletes, can be really blessed to have outside of their performing lives if they develop this sense of trust in self too. So again, the concepts in this book are very good, important. The book is clearly and well written. And coming back to it all these years later, not having read it for more than two decades, I can say that that's what really drew me into this book in the first place is how clearly he presents these concepts. So go get this book about tennis and enjoy and digest and process it because he's got a lot of great ideas in here.